what? Tithes and offers. Well, Brother Greg, I just gave him every bit of the money I had. I want you to know something. Uh, just your tithes and offering does not just deal with what man has to offer, but it deals with something from the inside of you. And it's time that you begin to give God the tithes of your praise and worship that he is due. We need to offer up some praise and some worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. For the day that he has afforded unto us. There's a thing going on today with a lot of significance. Well, give me them glasses right there. Yeah, there's somebody, the ladies have lost a pair of glasses they are up here. If you hadn't, I'll probably put them on and start wearing them. Now, somebody tell me what today is. The date. 13th. That's what I thought it was. My watch lied. My watch is still hung up on the government time. It ain't the government system no more. It's the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of things going on in significance today. For when the 13th year, this 13th day of the first of the Romantic, Romantic, Romanic, whatever, how you would say it, calendar. Now, got a text message early this morning that there was going to be some people that weren't going to be here because their grandbaby at Brother Michael Beachy's church was being dedicated this morning. Baby. He said that he would give to the church daily them that's going to be saved. So there's a baby dedication that has been born and it's being dedicated this morning. That's a great thing. A few weeks ago, we was able to take little John which was a symbolization of John the Baptist coming. And it was a symbolization of him being baptized uh, unto the authority that was given at that time, which he said, Jesus, I, I, I'm not worthy to baptize you, but I'm in need of being baptized of you. You know, I'm not worthy to dip you, Jesus. But Jesus said at that time, he said it is not so uh, that the, the scriptures might be fulfilled. There's a reason for doing this. Now, there was another reason that was coming for uh, God to allow me to baptize or John, uh, recognizing that it was time uh, for the revelation to come over into where the kingdom was. Because John the Baptist, he was the understanding of the revelation given in that day. But it comes a time that man has to yield his understanding and get over into the mind of God. Now, today we're going into another understanding because uh, Brother Michael, where he is back there, he needs to be on this front row, leave that woman alone, get away from that woman and get up here and sit where you belong. There's an understanding today that Brother Michael has already been baptized, but through his own mission, there was some reason why he needed to be baptized again. He wasn't and isn't being baptized this morning unto the understanding of salvation, but he wants God to begin to revelate his mind. Huh? That was what he called and asked me. He didn't call and ask me to be baptized because he wanted uh, to be saved or to have sanctification or salvation. He called and he said, Brother Greg, I believe I need to go further into the understanding or higher level in God, so therefore I think I need to be baptized. It's good. I like it. I like it. I love it. Oh, the other thing is I want some more of it. <laughs> uh, we started something the other day with a whole looking old Christian back there where, oh my God, I love having young people get involved. Uh, I'm seeing something brand new in the day that we're living in. Oh, hallelujah. I didn't know but a little bag machine back here working cameras this morning. And a few weeks ago, God has really dealt with me on Sardis Church, began to worship and began to praise him, began to thank him, began to go back and start giving him some honor, give him some glory. He began to say, if you'll worship me, I will bring down everything shaken out of heaven and I'll restore it back unto you. But you're going to get up. You're going to get some excitement about you. You're going to bring life to you. Years ago, Brother White was up here, and we understand Brother White gets a lot of revelations, a lot of understandings of things that sometimes maybe we don't see. But the Bible says over in Revelation, it says, Sardis, I got an ought against you. 
Uh, you seem to think that you're perfect, but you're not. You've got some problems. Huh? Well, due to your pastor, Sardis might have thought that they had a better revelation of some things. Sardis might have thought they had a better understanding of things. Sardis might have thought because of the pastor that he could pray through any situation. And you would be all right. A sardis might have thought that the Melchizedek seed only dwelt here in this one place. Sardis might have thought a lot of times, uh, but God has reminded me, Sardis, I got an ought against you, and the Bible said it starts in the pulpit. It starts behind the sacred desk, so it began to deal with this old boy. But since I decided that Greg was the problem and it's not the church, The church is only led by example, and if I'm not worshiping, if I'm not praising God, then it's my fault you're not doing it. So we had to make a change, you understand? We went down to the corner of the road, and we made a whole different situation. We come back in here, we began to worship, began to praise God, we began to see God began to move for us. Now, Brother White came up a few years ago, And it said that the name of Sardis Church was no longer that name, but it had been changed from Sardis to Sardius, a precious stone in the eyes of God's covenant that he laid out in the breastplate or the breast shield of God, that it was not no longer Sardis. You remember this. It was no longer Sardis, but it was Sardius, a precious stone in the breastplate of God. On this way that we will become a precious stone in God's breastplate, his began to honor him, began to glorify him, began to worship him, began to praise him. Get our earthly carnality out of here. Get our traditions go. Get rid of them. Become the man and women of God that we were called to do. They called Last night, Brother Don Abernathy is supposed to go over here in a little bit to do some baptism of his own. And I said, that's all right. You can do it right after we get through. They said, when will you be through, Brother Greg? 1230. I said, I don't know. I preached two hours last week. I feel like I might be able to do three and a half today alone. Now, listen. Baptizing John. I tell you what, John, come here. Stand right here. Just stand right there and look at the people. Michael, come up here and stand beside him. Now then, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. All right? We have two brothers standing here. They share the family together, do they not? Now, Even though that Michael was baptized years ago, it was not for the understanding that it is today, so we're going to say that does not count in what we're doing today. Now, little John, out of his own omission, went to his mom and his daddy and said, I need to get saved. So they began to talk to him on how he needed to pray for himself. They didn't lead him in, well, if you'll bow down and and you'll say, repeat these words after me, that this will happen. They said, John, you need to have a talk with God. You need to get down and and really talk to the Lord Jesus Christ because mama can't save you, daddy can't save you, but the Lord Jesus Christ can. He died on the cross. He hung there. He shed his precious blood. He took the stripes before he ever went to the cross, y'all. He took the stripes before he ever went there. He kept his mouth shut when they were striping him before he ever went to the cross. We can remember on the cross, he didn't ever do nothing but say, I need some water. I'm a thirst. I need, oh, if, he, if you could only understand what he was crying out for, he wasn't crying out for a natural drink. He was saying, I need God to move right now. I need some water. I'm thirsty because the Bible said God had turned his back on the flesh. And he said, oh, I need something to drink. You don't understand the separation that I'm going through. I'm a thirst. I need God in my life or I'm just an old, wretched, miserable man. I'm just a serpent 
that was hung in the day of Moses upon the cross. He said, I'm a thirst. I don't want to be a serpent. I want to be a servant. Amen. Now, glad y'all young, y'all might stand there all day. And when I'm on the piano, you better start leaping for joy when I can't. I'm going to get a belt and I'm going to get you to leap. Now, out of his own admission, with, how old are you, son? Eight years old, new beginning, that he began to seek salvation, not from mom and daddy, not because he was afraid of a whipping, because he fell in love with the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he wanted to know him as the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. At an eight-year-old new beginning understanding. So he begins to pray and he finds salvation. Time went by. Because see, in salvation, there is a process of salvation. You don't get saved just because you come down to the altar and say, God, forgive me. You get a starting point. Then you got to go out there and get rid of them attributes that you've carried around so long. See, sin is nothing but unbelief. Huh? Drinking, smoking, doping, running around, whoring, and all these other things is not sin. It's an attribute of sin. Huh? It goes around lying, all these things. They're, they're attributes. Sin is unbelief, willfully transgression of the law. That's what sin is. Paul said if it wasn't for the law, I would have never had known sin. The rest of it is, well, we're already doing this. We might as well do it all. It's attributes of it. It just goes along. So there's a process of salvation that we go through. It's a time period. It's a difference in what we was talking about in Sunday school this morning. If you're an adult and you weren't there, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But if you as an adult and you care about learning more about God, you'd have been in the Sunday school class this morning. If I busted your hide, good. I'm glad I did. I don't apologize for it. Pay me later. Now, we said in Sunday school class that if you fell down and bruised your knee, you would get up and you'd just shake it a little bit just to shake the pain out of it. Because Satan is a spirit, he attaches himself and he causes pain. And you shake that devil loose, he'll leave. You shake that devil loose this morning and start praising and worshiping God. When you get, oh God, when you start jumping, Satan can't hold on. You leap for joy, he can't hold on. You'll get rid of that spirit that you got. But now you fall down and you cut your leg. That's a little bit different of a vibration and you have to go through a process to get it to heal up. But it will heal if you'll continue the process. All right. Little John, he goes through the process of salvation in his own understanding at the age that he is and I'm so thankful for it. He's got a better understanding than most people that's 80 and 90 years old. But he goes through this process and he comes to me one day Mom and Daddy said, don't be afraid. You need to talk to Brother Greg. You need to ask Brother Greg. And, and he's like a lot of little men. He was a little bit afraid to talk to me. But finally I told him, I said, son, when you have what you want to say to me, just come and talk to me. So that morning as I sat down on the altar and he come, I picked him up. <laughs> the Bible said that Jesus said, don't run them children off. <laughs> Suffer the little children to come to me. And if you've ever seen the little old pictures of growing up with Jesus and the children, he had them right there with him. He put them on his lap. He loved them and he cared for them and he let them know how that they were loved. That there was no harm coming to him. Jesus is not harmful. He is the loving part of God. Huh? He's the loving part of God. If we're going to be Jesus in this day, we got to be the loving part of God. I want you to know something. In the Old Testament, sin could not live in the camp. God destroyed the entire family, the dogs, the animals, the children, the birds, everything. When sin was found in the camp, God destroyed it. But in the New Testament, Jesus come. He come as the love of God. He makes a different statement. He said, I will nourish you and I will cherish you. I will spank your bottom. You parents that don't believe that your children do not do anything wrong, don't let them mess up in front of me because I will spank their bottom. And if you object, I will spank your bottom. Naturally speaking. I get that straight right off the bat. I talked to a man yesterday about starting a Christian school. Told him what we was going through and what we had to deal with. And I said, we still discipline our children. We don't beat them, we don't abuse them. 
But if they're needing correction, we will correct them. That's what Jesus does for you. He will spank your bottom. He will correct you. Well, Brother Greg, I am 65 years old. He will spank your bottom. Huh? My dad is 80 years old in a few days. I watch what I say to him because I will pick myself up off the ground and I'm 47 years old. Correction never gets to an age that you don't need it. John, he comes up, gets in my lap. He says, I need to be baptized, Brother Greg. I said, Mom and Daddy tell you that? He said, no, sir. It's something that I see. I said, Mom and Daddy didn't make you do this. They didn't encourage you to... To, to do this and bring it up. Not, no, no, bro, Greg, it's something that God's dealing with me over. So we got baptized. Huh? All right, we see what's going on. Oh, let me tell you something. Y'all don't know the story. You, you wouldn't understand what I'm telling you. He's got people that he loves coming against him now. He's got people that ought to be picking him up and loving him, taking him hunting, taking him fishing, taking him out, buying him gifts that is mad at him and treating him like a, a piece of trash and a piece of dog that you don't even know about. Treating his mom and daddy like they're dogs. And it's all on account of this young man had a revelation. And he's finding the Lord Jesus Christ real and precious. Well, you find Jesus real and precious and sincerely you'll have problems in your life too. Age still doesn't matter about that. Huh? The Bible says, tarry till Jesus comes. I don't preach doom and gloom, but if doom and gloom comes, you're still victorious over it. So we don't worry about it. We just go on with Jesus. All right, now, he's the first. He was the last to be born. He was the first to be baptized unto some understanding of revelation. He represents the little eaglet this morning. Huh? You know what you get before you get an eagle, don't you? You get an eaglet. A baby eagle. One that's in the nest. One that's got some soft feathers there. Come against this little eaglet and see what mama back there does. Huh? I might whip his little bottom but I'll probably have to whip his mama's bottom too. Huh? I, that's true. I'm all man. I just don't have no problem with that. He's an eaglet. He's got some cushioned feathers in that nest. But up under them feathers is some awful, awful thorns that the nest is made out of. They're sharp. And they're not going to rot. These are made of vines that will last forever. And mama, from the time, from now, till it's of the age that this eaglet must learn to fly, will slowly begin to take the cushion out from under his precious little bottom. You understand what I'm saying this morning? There's going to come a time when he thinks mama no longer loves him. And those real nice cushions and those nice loving arms back there, little John, one day are going to look rough. And they're going to look mean. And they're going to look like mama don't love you. But mama has just become, finally, huh, finally, what daddy has been saying for years, quit babying him and let him grow up to be a man. Huh? Quit babying him. You know, mom and daddies have a lot of talk when you've got a real man and a real mama. Mama wants to really protect that baby and daddy wants to make a man out of it. Huh? Daddy wants to say, I'll beat the hide off of you. Mama brought you in this world, but daddy will take you out of it. Huh? And he really wants to put the correction down and he wants help. Buddy, when he looks up, you don't, need a, you don't no longer need a signed contract when you look at his son. He wants his son to look at him eyeball and eyeball, reach out like they did in the days of the of origin and say, I will do what I say I'll do. That's what daddy is trying to do. He's trying to make a man out of him. Mama's trying to keep him a baby. The church is representation of the mama. 
and it gets all of it, all you eagles in. And uh, the mama comes in and it begins to, to try to protect you. Oh, it's okay. Oh, yes. I, oh, well, it's all right. You, oh, you fell down. You made a mistake. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Come on in. We love you. We love you. Oh, come on in. Oh, you made a mistake. That's all right. It's all right. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. And it comes in there. Then you get one real man of God that steps up behind the pulpit one morning and looks out across the thing and he says, if you die in your sins, you will bust hell wide open straight in your sorry hide up. And mama runs around and says, I can't believe he said that to my children. I can't believe he talked like that to my kids. I can't believe he said that. I tell you one thing we'll do. He'll hit the road or we will. Huh? Is that right? Talk to me, church. You'll run a preacher off in a heartbeat if he ain't a real man. Oh, you tried to run me off some of you, but I won't run them too fat. <laughs> so we either change congregations or change preachers, and guess what? I'm not going nowhere. Huh? That's what happens with the church. Am I right, Brother Michael? Gets a little bit hot. The people start seeing that preacher starting to tighten down, beginning to give them some instruction that will make them men and women of God. They get mad and they want to get another preacher in there or they got to go to another church where they can find that passing fire again. So, mama wants to nurture the baby. Daddy wants to make it fly. Mama's going to start pulling them feathers out one day, John. Ooh, that cute little rear end that's running around there and making Mama so happy one day, she's going to pull it out and the thorn's going to prick it. Uh-huh. Oh, Mama, you didn't rub me that time. No, you, you popped that mouth off to me, John. That was a belt that just got, that got part of that. Oh, that... That wouldn't, oh, it's okay, I love you. Here, have another cookie. Huh? It was smack. Mama, that hurt my hand. You shouldn't have had it in the cookie jar when I told you to keep it out of it. Well, Mama, you used it. It was okay. It's not okay no more. Another little feather's come out. So sooner or later, go sit down. Thank you, son. To sooner or later, you got a, how old are you? Almost 19-year-old, supposed to be grown man, living in mama's house. At 16 years old, during the summer, I packed my bags, moved out of mama's house with mama crying tears in her eyes. Because my daddy raised me to work and I hit Everton, Georgia, uh, going up and working up there from sun up to sundown and then sun. Huh? When the summer was over with, I came back and smile come back on mama's face and I come into her house until I was 17 years old and I went to school for a half a year and at the uh, age of 17 in January, I graduated high school, I packed my bags and I walked out of mama's house again with her crying. I went to work because daddy was trying to make a man out of me. He's changing today. Mama been pulling them needles, I mean pulling them feathers out from under him. She babied him for a long time. I could go in some things that she babied him on. I preached against. You think it made Mama happy with me preaching against some things that, that was going on? No. I got, I got ridiculed for it. It's all right, Sister Sandra. I know you love me. And I love you. I got ridiculed for it. I got talked about it. But you see, they have stuck in. They hung on. Why? Because they know that if I preach it, if you can get it in the Bible and show me where I'm wrong, I'll change what I say. And I'll admit that I was wrong about it. But if I preach it and it's in the Word of God, I won't compromise with you or the president. I'll whip him if he doesn't like it. God will bust his hat. Huh? 
It's about time that we stand up for what the word of God says and quit worrying about what man says. So we have this young man right here that has grown into manhood. He thinks. He's pushed it. Mama's still protecting him because daddy walks in and catches him popping off to mama. Daddy says, son, I'm going to beat the living daylights out of you like the man you're supposed to be. I'm not going to use no belt on you no more. You're too big. I'm going to put something on you that you know is right. Mama said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me protect him a little bit longer. Bill says, no, he's going to grow up and he's growing up today. So Mama's still trying to shove a feather under that little cushion. Bill, being the daddy, reaches over and says, too much, too long. He pulls the last feather out, kicks the bottom of the nest. The prongs go up in his rear end. He has to become a man and begin to fly out of the nest. Huh? Does it feel good? No. But today, the eaglet is changing, making a metamorphosis into an eagle today, and he's going to learn to fly. Have a seat, son. <laughs> Brother Stan, the message today, the eagle metamorphoses are transforms into... The eaglet metamorphoses are transformed into the eagle. You hear that? Did you hear me? Yes. The message today, the title of the message, the eaglet transforms metamorphoses into the eagle. Turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 37. For you that believe that scriptures must be read before a man preaches... You're going to get your wish and you're going to probably change your thinking today when I get through reading because it's going to be a little bit lengthy for you. Your cushion may not be too soft when I get through reading today. Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, I set that little foundation there for you to understand what takes place. There's several things that an eagle is born with. An eagle is actually born with a higher intelligence than all the other birds. An eagle is born with better eyesight than all the other birds. An eagle has a double set of eyelids that when it begins to have the birds of prey chase it, that it can fly directly into the sun. And the sunlight becomes so great because you know the closer you get to the sun, the brighter it is, right? And the more heat that it produces, the closer you are. The birds of prey cannot handle that because they don't have the protection that an eagle has. (laughs) What a message. And as the birds of prey begin to attack an eagle and that eagle focuses its its eyes on the sun and it begins to close its natural eyes and it gets a protection over them, it feels the sun begin to get hot, it feels the sun begin to get closer, it doesn't back down but it begins to strive to fly straighter and closer and faster to the sun and as the birds of prey begin to encroach upon it, they cannot handle the heat, they cannot handle handle the pressure they cannot handle the brightness of the sunlight and they'll fall away every time in other words God has put something inside of an eagle that the birds of prey cannot capture it it will be fly in the right direction we understand that then is that clear all right I don't preach a lot of deep things until you'll go to pulling. And if you'll pull, I'll open up some understanding to you that will blow this world to pieces. We said this morning, you chewed on a pacifier long enough. You've got holes all inside of that pacifier. You chewed it till it, there's no more good left in it. The sugar's run off of the tit, and it's about time you get a hold of the real deal and put some meat in your life. Huh? 
let's begin to read. This is a very common, I preached on the Valley of Dry Bones many times. But today it's got a different understanding. The hand of the Lord, that is a capital L-O-R-D, y'all. That Lord is different than capital L, little O-R-D. Capital L, little O-R-D could be me or you with a simple understanding that the Bible said, Jesus said, in your own scriptures you write your God's. So with a capital L and a little O-R-D, it's talking about us. But with a capital L-O-R-D, there's only one that it's talking about. Numero uno, the creator of all things. Yes, the creator of life, the creator of death, the creator of good, the creator of bad, the creator of, 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 of salvation, the creator of sin. Can't sin enter into a city unless God sends it. No, I created both good and evil and have my what in both of them? My pleasure. God has pleasure in evil? Yes, he does. He will use it to straighten your hide out. He will have you go into captivity until you fall down on your knees and ask for forgiveness. He will allow the, 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 the beast of the field to come against you. They'll be telling you the whole time that they're king of the jungle and they're nothing but a loud mouth lion. I'm going to preach that message. The Lord's going to allow me to preach that message on the lion and the lamb. I wear the lion. And then he said he's coming back as a roaring lion. Now listen. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. Whose spirit? Whose spirit? The Lord's Spirit, L-O-R-D, not yours, not carnality, not your natural way of thinking, but the Lord's, His Spirit. You cannot get anything. There's sometimes God to give you a dream, there's sometimes you ate too many beans and you have a bean dream. You got to be able to discern the difference. Oh, I thank you, son. I even thought about Robert this morning. I might just say something about him. How, look at that. What did the Bible say? Blessed just to bring a drink of water. Something on that line. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. <laughs> Calls me to pass by them round about. Behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. So, he goes out. The first thing he does is God sets him down. Sometimes God's got to sit you down to get your attention. You're running to and fro. You're doing your own thing. You've got too much business going on. You're chasing too many young girls. God can't deal with you when you're in the carnality. You won't come to church. You'll go get a job somewhere and you won't come to church. You'll run and do this, run and do that, but you won't pray. You won't seek what God says about it. So God gets to a point sometimes, he sets you down. I don't understand why I'm laying on my flat of my back. Because you're not listening to God. He's got to slow you down. He's got to get your attention before you lose everything. So he takes Ezekiel out. He sets him down. He looks out. He sees a valley of dry bones. And I just want to preach this morning, Brother Carlos. I just want to preach, but I can't. I've got to teach this morning. The Lord's letting me take over the, the third grade class. I guess that the girls are in the third grade class. He's allowed me to take them over, buddy, and I am enjoying it. Uh, for I tell you something, I was born to teach. I don't, I've always thought I was a sorry preacher. I love to teach. I love to explain things. I love people to ask me questions. But he looked over there and he took him out and he set him down and he, he began to look over dry bones. But that isn't all that God done is just let him look. The Bible said it caused him to pass him around back, around about.
Now, for you that's listening on the tape, I'm walking around and I'm looking at the congregation this morning, the ones that'll look at me. I'm looking at them eyeball to eyeball. God's causing me to pass by. And he's causing me to check them over, John. There we go. He's causing me to look and see if I can get them eyeball to eyeball. I got one glance and it turned away from me real quick. And I'm beginning to check them out to see what is missing that is causing them to be dry. What's dry? Why? I got a smile even out of that one as he's looking at me in the camera. What's dry and going on in their lives? What's happening and what's taking place? Why are they in the situations and the problems that they're in? Hey there, precious. Why are they where they're at? Why are we not any further in the Lord and His understanding than where we are at? Why have we not made the transformation today to become an eagle instead of an eaglet? Why are we still dependent upon what the government says instead of what God says? There's my man up there. Why are we still dependent upon what the doctors say? I got a phone call the other day in school. Brother Matthew was happened to be there with us, Sister Katie, and there was all the rest of them and my wife. And I have an uncle that I've always loved, and he's married to Mama's sister, and they put him in the ICU. He had a a heart attack, and they got him in ICU, and and uh, uh, they didn't know what was going on. They uh, have give him that he's got congestive heart failure, and they come in, and they uh, I finally got a hold of my cousin yesterday morning, and they to take the step back till Friday. That uh, when I got the message that it was going on, I called for Katie and Matthew and and and, and Evelyn and myself, and we joined hands. And we begin to say, thus saith God. I use Ezekiel. What is it? Exactly. I use Ezekiel 16.6. When I passed by, saw thee polluted into thy own blood, I said unto thee, live. I say unto thee, live. I use that scripture for anything that deals with the pumping of the blood and the life that it gives. And I began to pray with the help of the ones that was with me, and we began to call upon thus saith God. And we began to cry out to thus saith God to send the angels that deal with that situation, get them on the path immediately. Doctor said, when I got a hold of my cousin, go ahead and make your preparations now. He's going to die. No hope, none given. The world will not give you any hope in your life today. They refuse to because they have no hope of their own. They cannot see anything but the natural to give you any hope. So they can only see what they see. It's not their fault. Doctors are great in their own understanding. They have a training for the natural things. God has all the understanding. He created it all. So I called her. We talked. We went to the hospital yesterday. He was asleep when we got there. I just sit there. Mom and and Aunt Louise went over to a side and they began to talk and, you know, what the doctors are saying. You know all the things and the steps you go through. My cousin walks into the room and, Mama comes over and she wakes up daddy gently. She began to caress his leg. Man was in a good sleep. I thought maybe you ought to leave a man alone. He's probably tired. Huh? Men, we could say why we would be tired, but I got enough women in here getting mad at me. Began to just caress his leg a little bit. Oliver, Oliver, and he opened his eyes. And his eyes saw his daughter. 
Hallelujah. His eyes saw his child. His eyes took hold upon something that wasn't in the room before and it lit up his life. It changed everything inside of him. He saw that his daughter had come to commune with her father. It made a change on the inside of him. I'll go ahead and tell you this. He's still alive today. They ain't won yet. I'm still believing they ain't going to win. Not till God says, come home, buddy. Your work's completed. And when he does, he still won't die because he's already made his salvation. He's just going to make a change. Hallelujah. But now understand this. When you come into where God is and you gently wake him up, Oh, I worship you, God. Father God, oh, I praise you, Lord. I don't want to sit here and ask you to do anything for me, God, but I want to do something for you. Lord, I want to be precious in your sight. I want to work for you. I love you so much. Oh, I'm not here to beg and plead with you for anything, God. I just wanted to tell you I love you. You kneel down and you tell God instead of, God, can you heal can you heal me of my cancer? Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you kill that rotten husband I got? Yeah, you know you prayed it. I'd kill him myself, God, but they'll lock me up. They won't lock you up, God. Can you just let him have an accident? Lord, I, I really don't even want him dead. Can you break both his legs? Then I slap him around. Oh, you prayed some horrible things. You know you have. But if you'll come in and you'll just gently wake God up with I love you. I love you. Oh, I, I, I just, I, I don't want you to do anything for me, God. I just want to do something for you. Lord. A smile will come upon the Father's face. You'll renew inside of Him the joy of life. As we saw yesterday, it'll make a change of the countenance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, he'll turn around to his children. He'll say, I love you. I love you. I love you. I want to do something for you. When my children are not afraid of me, and they actually come and ask me if they can do something, I usually let them do it. Sometimes I might not even think it's the best thing in the world for them, but they want to do it so bad, I let them do it. Huh? He let me try my wings because I asked him to. Even though he knew that I couldn't fly. The valley which was full of bones, and he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? I've been asked this question lately. Can Sardis live? God's been asking me this question lately, church. Can Sardis live? And I had to say, Oh, God, I don't know if I can make a change or not. Only you know, God, can we live? Can we quit acting like we can live and actually begin to live? There's a difference. Most people never know when I'm going through anything because I'll put on a fake smile, I'll put on a false happy, and they really don't know that I'm miserable on the inside. The Lord's allowed us to pray for people, raise the dead, Heal the blinded eyes. And I'm talking about naturally, literally. I'm not bragging. This is all God. God has allowed people to come to me and say, we've got a crisis in our home, in our household. We need God to answer. And through the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, I grabbed their hands and began to pray with them. And Lord would heal them. He would raise them from the dead. He would heal blinded eyes. He's made diseases go away. Naturally. I'm talking about you have seen it 
and on the inside, I'm the most miserable person in this world. If I died, I was afraid I'd go to hell. Miserable. Dying. But to you, you never knew what kind of shape that I was in. I don't want you to go around today with a false hope and a false lie. I don't want you to go around with dry bones and everybody thinking that you're, that you're alive and well and walking. I want you to find that life and life more abundant and be happy and be rejoicing, be joyful and not sorrowful. When the people look at you in the world, they really do see a difference. When church time gets close, about six hours before church, you'll start getting excited and you won't miss it. Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I prophesy to you this morning, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of Yahweh this morning. Hear the words of Yahuwah this morning. Hear the words of Yahshua this morning. Hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. For he speaks into your dry bones and he's going to raise you up out of the valley of death. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you. Sinews does what? It does what? Helps move the joints. It connects you to the bones. It gives you some stability. It gives you the ability to bend, to bow, to walk, to talk. It gives you the ability to, uh, when the brain processes an order, for it to be carried out. It's what links you to the stability or the strength, the bones. He said, I'm going to put some sinews on you. I'm going to connect you. I'm going to make you one flesh. I'm going to cover them dry bones up. They ain't going to be dry no more. I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin. You know what happens when the old skin dies away? New skin comes on. I'm going to put some flesh on you. The old flesh is dead. It's rotted. It's gone. It's destroyed. The old way of thinking, the old way of understanding, the natural things of how you think it should go, all that is going to dissipate. It's going to return into the earth. It's going down into the natural earth. It's going to, it's going to become dust. It's going to become what them little old, uh, dust mites do. They eat that old, sorry flesh up when you lay down in your bed at night and you start to rot. Do you know that? This has to come from God. I ain't even ever thought about this. When you lay down in your bed at night and you begin to roll around on them old mattresses and them old sheets, your dead, rotten skin begins to come off of you and it begins to get sunk down into your mattress. It begins to go away and God replenishes you, refreshes you, gives you new skin again. Then them old dust mites, they come along and they're supposed to eat up all that rot. That's what the raven does. He eats up all the rot. You're not supposed to give him anything fresh. He'll put breath in you. And what is breath? Life. It's your soul. It's something that's happy and precious. He'll put breath in you. You shall live. You shall know that I am the Lord. How many of you really know who the Lord is today? You saw him lately. There's a shadow of a doubt. You know his voice when he speaks. You hear when he calls. You see him when he walks. I can be in a position, and I have been there, that I heard my daddy's voice, and I began to look around. I've got like horse's ears when you... 
click an old horse, his old ears will perk just like that. And he'll begin to listen. They'll be laid back and they'll stand straight up because they understand the voice of the one that's in control. My daddy would speak. He caught me doing things and he spoke and I, and I like I fell out of the chair, caught me. Caught me in the very act. You think daddy done anything? He said, Greg, does that belong to you? And I said, yes, sir, it does. It broke his heart and he turned around and he walked away. Just a little while, I went hunting my daddy down. And I went across the old field where he was working at. And he was out there just working and just a slaving. And I walked up to him and I said, Daddy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you caught me in the very act of it. He said, Son, you don't understand that those things will kill you. The rapid in the McKinney family cancer goes wild and they'll kill you. It'll destroy your life. And I was concerned. Did you quit that habit? Not immediately. But them words rang out. Son, is that you? (laughs) It wasn't very long. You that's got caught up into a habit today, let me tell you, it wasn't very long. I was working in drywall. I was in a house in Walnut Grove, Georgia, standing on the second floor. I, I done got to the point I didn't know if I had a cigarette lit and when I lit the other one. I was worse than any chain smoker you ever saw. I would be like smoking two cigarettes and look down. Didn't even know it. Them words ringing out into me, son, they'll kill you. I love you. They'll kill you. Standing on that second story floor and a close friend of mine down there, me and him was partners in the business. And I looked at him. It was the last one in a pack coming close upon Christmas. Not me realizing less than 30 days I was going to preach my first message, real message in a church. Didn't understand, didn't know that. Brother Clayton Milligan was supposed to go with Daddy to a 50-day revival. He was supposed to preach. Something come up. He couldn't go. I went, and I stood in Brother Clayton Milligan's place and preached for the first time. Standing on that second-story floor, I looked at my friend, and I told him, I said, this will be the last cigarette Greg McKinney ever picks up and puts to his lips. He looked at me, and he said, Greg, it is impossible for you that's friends for you. <laughs> He's great. Ain't no way. I said, son, my mind is made up. You'll never see this old boy put another cigarette to his lips. Greg, it is impossible for you. You've done it too long. You've done it too much. I looked at him. Brother Bill, I took that last draw. You know, people got to take the last draw. Got to get the good out of it. That's what Christians do. They suck on sin to the last straw. How many of you ever, ever had a habit of smoking cigarettes and you got down there and smoked the butt? That filter is nasty, isn't it? You get a hold of, you can deal with that, that, that nicotine going down into your lungs and that smoke. You get a hold to the butt because you don't want to give it up and you burn that little uh, filter that's in there, that is nasty. I sucked it down to the filter, Brother Carlos. I had to get the last good of all of it until it burnt and it became nasty and it became that I understood that is not what I want. I stuck it down and I put the old foot down. And I began to crush it. And the more I crushed that old cigarette filter, the better I felt. The more I got happy. The more I looked down there, my buddy was shaking his head, no way. God was saying, yes way. I bought a lot of bubble gum. Didn't need it. But I heard that's what people do. So I really put the market out on bubble gum. 
I began to chew on that bubble gum. Didn't need it. A couple of days went by. Hadn't smoked a cigarette. Hadn't bought a pack. Old Scotty come up with a little old thing. He said, Greg, I think you're serious. He said, so I went to this herbal store and I got you this little stuff called Nicorette. You get a desire for a cigarette, just put a little drop on your tongue and it'll take care of that problem. I tried it. I didn't need it. But I thanked him for doing it because he saw a difference in my life. He saw a change was beginning to take place. The world looked and saw that there was a difference in me. A little drop on the tongue will help out, y'all. From the abundance of the heart, what, what causes the vibrations inside of your throat to begin to vibrate that allows the sound to come out? But if you don't have a tongue, then when you begin to speak it, it just goes... Bleh! But when you have a tongue to control the consonants and the vowels, then your words are plain. Told you it might be a three-hour message. If you don't like it, just get up and leave. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. Last few weeks, y'all, I don't know if you've understood it, there's been a shaking. Huh? There's something different going on. To me, is it to you? Brother Carlos, where was you at a month ago? About a month ago. Maybe, maybe a week over a month ago. Where was you at? You weren't in Georgia, was you? Where was you at? Arkansas. What in the world happened to cause you to come back to Georgia? Spirit of the Lord. There was a shaking that shook you out of Arkansas. <laughs> I had jumped for that alone. Man was thousands of miles away and God began to dip with him. Said, I want you to know something. Brother Wesley White wrote a song. There's a strong east wind blowing across Georgia and it's building the city of God. They're building the city of God. There's a shaking that took place in Arkansas and it shook him out of the hills and began to send him on down to where God was beginning to move. Not that God's not moving in Arkansas, but he's part of this family. And he had to come home. What a message in itself. A shaking that's taking place. A shaking that's going on. Not just in Sardis this morning, but in the household of God, there's a shaking going on. Preachers that are real men of God are starting to not talk about one another. First thing. Preachers that are men of God are not talking about denominations anymore. Preachers that are men of God are not talking about lay members anymore. That's where the shaking is beginning yet. The Bible said if it begins with us, where is the end of it? And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above. But there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. What is the wind? Jesus prophesied unto the wind, didn't he? <laughs> ah, my, 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 my. Woo. If you could only understand them tongues this morning. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man. Say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe upon these slain that they may live. I want you to know this morning, I prophesy to the four winds. I prophesy to come to Sardius this morning. I confess unto you that the breath of God must come. Come to us, wind, and bring life and not death. Bring words to shake us out of our carnality. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, stood upon their feet, 
an exceeding great army. God's making a change this morning. He's changing us from darkness to light. He's changing us from heathens to Christians. He's changing us from mortality to immortal. He's changing us from carnal to incarnality. He's taking away corruption this morning, putting in corruption upon us. He's making us the army, the household of Israel today. Give the Lord a hand clap. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Have you not been saying that lately? Have you not been discouraged? Have you not been down? Have you not been out? Have you really wondered if there was a God? I have. Brother Greg, you have? Yes. I prayed victory for you, but I wondered where in the world was it at for me. I prayed that this old boy right here would get him a job. He got him a job. But I wonder why in the world can't I sell a car? Huh? I prayed for you that you and your children would have health. And you would have life. You could receive things of God. You could get a job. I prayed for Michael and little Michael that they could find work. I got a phone call about someone yesterday that used me for a reference and I don't see him in the house of God this morning. When I talk to him, I'm going to bust his hide. Dare use me for a reference and you won't even show up. I prayed for Brother Don. God run him out of the car cell down there just so he'd show up on Tuesday nights for church. I ain't told him that that man that was over that car cell don't even own it no more. He, he's, he's not the owner there no more. I'm scared he might go back. I prayed for y'all, but at the same time, I wondered if I even knew God. I wondered if I ever even heard from God. Confession is good for the soul. Lately, God's been shaking me. Sporadically, I heard that word from Brother Carlos, and it took recognition in my heart that sporadically I sold one car the day before Thanksgiving. I sold one car the day after Christmas, which was on my birthday. I didn't do it. The man sold it for me. I sold another car in the early parts of January. And boy, did God bless me on that deal. It blessed me so much. I got so much encouragement out of it. I done bought five and only sold one since then. But here it was, for months I couldn't sell a car. You talking about being snake bit? I couldn't sell, I couldn't even get a bid on a car. My cars would drive up and the people would turn and walk to another place. They wouldn't even look at my stuff. They would go and buy cars I know wouldn't even go and drive out of the lot. And here I know that I drive my stuff. It may not be the most perfect in the world, but I don't worry about it breaking down on the side of the road. May have a den in the old door somewhere, but at least the motor's not going to fall out before they drive out of the gate. Yes, sir, I'm confessing this morning. Months, two months went by, didn't even get them to look at the car. They did look at it, they turned their nose up. Went through there, like I said, sporadically the day before Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, y'all, when you enter into his gates, (laughs) into Thanksgiving. 
You want to know something? For two months before then that I didn't sell a car, I never forgot to thank God for selling my cars for me. Huh? I was smart enough to do that, Brother Don. When it looked all doom and gloomy to me, I said, thank you, Jesus, for selling my cars tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for not letting me buy a piece of junk tonight that I'm going to have to work on for the next six months that I still got sitting in my yard. The night before Thanksgiving, I sold that car. I was the happiest man alive then, I thought. On my birthday, I was down in South Georgia, down there cutting wood for my mom and daddy with my brother Brian right here. I got a phone call that night. Greg, I sold your truck for you. On my birthday, Ooh, didn't I? Didn't I thank God for my birthday present, Brother Brian? But on that Monday night, sitting in Dawsonville, Georgia, with my hands raised in the air, my knees bowed down on the ground, I thank God for getting me out of the government system of 2012. I thank God for getting me out of that condemnation. I thank God for bringing me into a brand new year, a brand new understanding, a brand new thing that I know for without a shadow of a doubt this morning. I'm not speaking to you in a hidden mystery, but I'm openly revealing it today. I thank God that this is the year of the kingdom. I'm not under the government no more. I'm not snake bit no more. I'm victorious today, and that's not no me just sitting there telling you, blabbing my mouth. I was the happiest man alive to get out from under 2012. Huh? He said in the Old Testament, if you'll look upon that old cross when he hung that serpent up there, that all that looked upon him would be healed of their snake bites. <laughs> Hallelujah. I hadn't thought about that, Brother Carlos. That's what he said, isn't it? When Moses hung that cross up there, uh, uh, hung that serpent, he told him, he said, all that look upon it shall be healed. And they put it because of the snake bites that were so bad of that day. All that look upon it. I want you to know something. Monday night, when it changed out of the old year to the new year, I looked upon the old cross. I looked up there and I no longer saw a serpent hanging there, but I saw the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and it changed my life and there's been a shaking going on. and saw a difference oh thank you God for your visitation especially through the elder oh Lord Jesus thank you then he said unto me verse 11 son of man these bones are the whole house of Israel behold they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost we're cut off from our parts therefore prophesy and say unto them thus saith the Lord God behold O oh my people I will open your graves Now that you that's come in the last couple of weeks, I thank you for coming on Sunday morning. I appreciate that. I really do. I need you. I love you for doing it. But the other day, if you don't come on Sunday night to hear the message that's going on, you're only getting half of what's taking place. If you don't come to Sunday school because you didn't have Sunday school where you grew up at, it doesn't change. You need to be taught. I, as the elder of the church, I still have to sit and get education. If you become a school teacher, you have to get further education. 
If you work in real estate, you have to have further education. If you're a car dealer, you have to go and get further education. If you're going to be a servant of God, you got to have further education. You don't know it all. Now, since you wasn't here Sunday night, you won't know what this is. Verse 13, and 13 represents Jesus Christ, right? It says, And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your grave. Now, Brother Carlos preached this message Sunday night a week or two ago, opening your graves. Opening your graves. If you didn't come, you don't know what he said. But if you was here, then you had an understanding of what he said. What did you see the light? I saw the light. What did he say? He said that my body is my grave. He said your body is your grave. The reason that you cannot have life in the steps that you are now is because you are covered in your grave and the Bible said the graves must burst open for you to come out. Jesus Christ was a symbolization of the dead being raised. On that, the Bible, we talk, oh man, they're going to be a rapture one day and them graves are going to burst open and the dead in Christ shall rise and they're going to walk. And I want you to know, if you'd ever read the Bible, you'd know that when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, the Bible said the graves burst open and those that was in there got up and the people looked around and saw the relative walking in the natural. That's already happened naturally. So if you're looking for a rapture today, go ahead and get on that first bus load and you'll wish that you would have been seed and not chaff. Because the seed is last, the chaff is first, and it was burnt up. Destroyed. Brother Carlos preached that your body has got you captured. Your carnality, your way of thinking. There's a shaking that's got to be taking place. What happens when an earthquake comes? It comes a shaking. Does anybody really know when an earthquake's going to happen? They can get close. They got technology that they can get close, but they cannot predict the exact minute. The Bible says that no man knows the exact time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only the Father. So when he grabs the old earth and he goes, it cracks. And what's on the inside comes out. When the Lord Jesus Christ grabs you in your sinful nature, and he shakes you, it'll crack. And what's on the inside must come out. And then it's a whole different outlook. It's a whole different understanding. Huh? Some people are so stupid. They have an earthquake. And it's a bad one. It's up on the Richter scale. It's shaken them. It has destroyed their families and, and their children. And their mamas and their daddies are dead. When the earthquake's over with, they say, whoo, that was a rough one. I guess we'll rebuild. The child of God says, rebuild it if you want to, you devil. I'm getting out of here. I'm going back down south. I'm going into a different part of the country. Brother Branham said that this place was going to fall into the ocean. That means that it's going to be destroyed, and I'm not going to be here with you. You want to stay over here with these Hollywood idiots, you just stay with them. Their ship's going down. Brother Greg, you prophesying that? I said that the prophet prophesied it. I'm agreeing with him. I'm not about to call him a liar, are you? 
No. He said that he saw Florida. For you that like to go down there and play in the ocean, he said he saw Florida swaying like a fish out of water as it broke off. Run on down there if you want to. It's closer than California. But either way, you'll find destruction in your life when you don't believe what the man of God says. <laughs> you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. Uh, is God opening your graves this morning? Is he opening them up? Is he shaking you? Has he grabbed you? Are you beginning to see something different? Is your traditions of men being lost? Huh? When you have an earthquake and or, 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 or a landslide, if you get into California and them landslides they have, and your house goes off the hill, you don't go down there and pick that thing up and bring it back to the top of the hill. It's destroyed. You got to build afresh. And the dummies go right back up on top of the mud. They build it again where it can wash away again. God said, listen, when are you going to wake up? Let the dead bury the dead. I think I got somebody on the outside that ought to come on in. <laughs> you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live. You shall live. When I put my spirit in you, you're going to live. I'm telling you this morning, if you'll let God get rid of your old dead house, God will bring a new one to you. Amen. Verse 14 says, And shall put my spirit in you. Well, Brother Greg, I don't want him putting your spirit in me. That's good because that's not what the scripture says. Brother Nathan, you sorry rascal, you ought not been here this whole service. I preached on you all day long and glad I did. He didn't say he put Greg's spirit inside of you. Greg's spirit will kill you. It won't lift you up. It won't heal you. It won't save you nor your children. But the Lord Jesus Christ will. The Lord Jesus Christ will. He'll put a shout in you. He'll put a dance in your feet. He'll put a leap in your step. He'll put it where you can jump, you can run, you can dance. He'll put it inside of you that when the people begin to look at you, they'll say, that's a man of God. That's a woman of God. That's a child of God. Oh, I want to be what they are. shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. You won't have to worry about it, Brother Greg's preaching the truth in them anymore. The Bible said the Holy Ghost will lead and guide you into truth. You won't have to worry about what Brother Greg's saying anymore. You won't have Brother Greg's understanding anymore. You won't be hanging on my coattail. Most of you won't even hug my neck this morning because I'm soaking wet. You say, oh, that's nasty. Don't want, want, don't want, oh God, oh he's nasty. I ain't touching him. It's all right. I'm getting rid of the poison that's on the inside of me this morning. One way or the other, it's coming out. One way or the other, there's going to be a change in me. One way or the other, I'm making a change for the better. One way or the other. And the other is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not my carnal way of thinking. It must be by his hands. Same thing must go for you. Brother Greg, I think that I don't really care what you think. I love you. Brother Nathan Abernathy back there, he knows I love him. I don't care one bit in this world what he thinks. Open up the scriptures and say, well, I, just, I don't care what you think the scriptures mean. It's thus saith God. What does his word say about the matter? That's what I'm interested in. Not what I think about it. It's not my spirit. It's not your spirit. But it's the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to shake us until our graves get gone and a new man begins to come up out of there and begin to rise, begin to leap, begin to shout, begin to rejoice in God. There's a shaking taking place 
the eagle it is becoming the eagle this morning. I got to finish this up. Shall put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. Then, yet, then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, not only spoken it, performed it, saith the Lord. Turn your Bibles over to uh, 38. Verse 18. You begin to look, this is Ezekiel prophesying against Gog and Magog and the battle that's to be taking place. I don't look for a battle to be taking place as most people preach it, but the battle's taking place this morning at Sardis. You hear me? Your Gog that's come against the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to render you, he's going to shake you, he's going to destroy you. There's going to be an earthquake or either you will die in the wilderness just like your forefathers did. Huh? You either got to make a change or go to hell. You either going to make a change or live in hell. I, I, I don't preach so much, Brother Nathan, as people going to hell as I preach they live in hell. Huh? That's what I preach. I preach, Brother Michael preached it the best I ever heard in my life, Brother Michael Pike. So you understand which Michael preached it. Brother Michael Pike said you'll either walk your way into heaven or you'll walk your way into hell. Make your choice. But you'll do it. God's not going to put you in either. You'll walk your way into it. It's according to how you live. You keep living the way that we've been living at Sardis Church, you're going to stay in hell. But if you'll make the change, as God showed me, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his courts with praise. God will make a change inside of you that you'll walk yourself into a place called heaven. In heaven, you find no health problems. In hell, you'll give the doctors all your money. In heaven, you'll find no need for no lawyer to keep you out of jail. In hell, you'll wish you could find a lawyer enough to keep you out of jail. In heaven, you'll find peace with all mankind. In hell, you'll have trouble all the days of your life. Which do you choose today? Verse 18, And it shall come to pass at the same time when God shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Remember where I started this morning. An eaglet has to metamorphose into an eagle. When mama pulls the last feather out of the nest and the cushion is gone and daddy takes and kicks that nest as hard as he can and imprints the nest into the seat of that eaglet's britches and it leaves a mark on him for life, he jumps out of that nest and he begins to fly. And when the birds of prey come against him, what does he do? He doesn't fly down into the water. He doesn't fly down and try to hide beneath the rock. He doesn't run over there and get behind of another bird. He doesn't go look for the vultures to take care of it. He doesn't run around and see if there's something out there that'll help him. The Bible said that he begins to look into the sun. And I don't mean the S-O-N this morning. I am I mean the S-U-N. I mean the S-O-N. He begins to look into the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he begins to set his eyes upon the where the safety net of God is. And he begins to take a flight and he begins to learn to fly right into the eyes and the heat of God and the bird of the prey cannot capture an eagle lit when he metamorphoses into an eagle. Why? Because the S-U-N becomes the S-O-N and the O-S-O-N will protect his own. My fury shall come up in my face. God will get mad when the world is endangering you. 
For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. It's a great shaking taking place. It shook Brother Carlos out of Arkansas. It shook you out of the television on Sunday mornings that you're finally coming. I believe God's fixing to shake you and you're going to have to be here on Sunday night and beg that we'd be here on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday all day long. I believe there's a change coming to the people of God. I believe there's an understanding coming to the people of God. I believe that the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ is fixing to be revealed. I believe that we're going to change from mortal to immortal. I believe we're going to change from corruption to incorruption. I believe we're going to take on the Melchizedek preacher of God and finally walk as sons and daughters of God the way we were created to do. I'm trying to finish. I don't know if the Lord is or not, but I am. Now, what did Peter say that we are? Fishers of what? All right, so understand the scriptures. Verse 20. So that the fishes of the sea, what does sea mean? Multitude of what? People. So that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heavens, that's the ones that think they got an understanding. <laughs> That's me and Brother Nathan. We think we know it all. I'm glad you come in, Brother Nathan. I needed somebody to pick on besides them. Me and why you do that? Brother Nathan's raised in Jesus' name. From his childhood up, his birth up. I was raised in it from my birth up. Me and him have gone back and forth over the scriptures. We battled carnally. We've had, have we not? We've done this. We love each other. We're still good friends. I'm pretty. He's ugly, and we all know it. So that's just the way it goes. I can't help it that he didn't get the blessings of my mom and daddy that gave me good looks. You know, it's just the way it is. But see, there's coming a time when me and Brother Nathan are no longer being a carnal mind. We won't have a carnal understanding. We won't sit there and try to kill each other. We won't sit there and say, I'm going to tell you one thing. Either you'll look at my way or I'll fight you and bust you over the head. We've done that. Huh? Been that way. People in carnality do this. Their carnal way of thinking. God's not pleased with our carnal way of thinking. He's pleased with his way and only his way. As Brother Rick said, when the shoe leather hits the road, you'll know the right way to walk. And if you can't get it, then the road runs east and west. Pick one way or the other and hit it. For the unrighteous cannot sit in the congregation of the righteous. That's what the Bible says. You're either going to get in or get out. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that last day there should be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the air, or of the heaven, and the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are, that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down. What is the mountains? The people that are high and mighty. Your government system. People that think they know it all. People think that they're in control or charge of God's people. A mental understanding that is not God's. That's high mountains. The Bible said that Satan is in the high places. And said we don't fight against powers and principalities. But of the air. Spiritual wickedness in what? High places. Well God said that's over. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. Now this is God's high people. This is God's elect. This is God's children. Saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. If a brother comes up and will not straighten up, will not live right, the word of God shall come up against him. And like I said, if he's a child of God, he's going to repent. He's going to change. His, it's going to shake him. When God grabs him, it's going to cause an earthquake. And I will plead against him with pestilence, with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his fans and upon the many people that are with him. And an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. 
What is this, y'all, when the trumpet of God begins to sound? Has it sounded today? Have I just been blowing off in the wind, or have you heard the trumpet of God? If you've heard the trumpet of God, then surely you're not waiting on some kind of rapture to take place. Surely your graves are busted open today. Surely you're ready for a translation today. Surely you're understanding that the trumpet of God has sounded. Thus will I magnify myself. Who is magnifying himself? The Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. And he said, I will sanctify myself. I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the capital L-O-R-D. I am God. And beside me there is no other. We started off with a little demonstration this morning. Of two brothers, one young, one old, one that's still in the nest of mama. Set them down for me. We started off with a little understanding that mama has got a nest built that's got thorns all around it. That's what you build an eagle's nest out of thorns. And every day of the life, Mama pulls a little thorn out, I mean a little feather out of the cushion that protects little John's rear end against the sharp things. She done that for old brother Michael right here. She protected Michael way beyond what me or daddy would have done, and we tried. Mama fought with us. That's true. I ain't going I ain't, am I telling the truth? Yeah, I'm telling the truth. This boy believed lies that he knew that he shouldn't believe. Mama protect. It's okay, son. You can believe that. Oh, it's all right, son. It's Daddy said, "My God, my God, turn your head, woman, and I'm gonna kick him right in the seat of his britches." Mama protected him for a while, but every day of his nest. Now his nest and John's nest are not the same. John's still a little eaglet. He's past due of being an eagle. Past due. So mama finally got down to there was one feather left in the cushion of Michael's rear end and the nest. She made a mistake. Mama turned her head. Mama turned her head just for a moment to get a biscuit out of the oven to feed that little baby boy from so many. You know, mamas never forget. I, I tell you, I'm 47 years old. Who am I? You're my baby. I'm her baby. 47 years old, I'm still the baby. 47 years old, I'm still the baby. If this baby gets in trouble, mama comes to the rescue, 47 years old. I want you to know something, but Bob McKinney is not, I'm not the baby. And if you ask him, he'll say, he is Mama George's baby. Because at the age of 18 or 17 years old, I was in trouble in a hospital. Mama come got me out of the hospital with kidney stone brought me back from South Georgia up here to her house, nurtured me back to health. I was paying my own rent, my own light bill, my own gas bills, my own food. 17 years old. Mama come got me, brought me home, Brother Bill, to nurture me just a little bit, get me back to health. Me and Daddy was out in the yard after I done got back to health a little bit. Daddy said something to me. I forgot. I'm still Bob McKinney's son. I'm not his baby. I'm his son. I popped my mouth off to him. He said, boy, there's a chain right here. There's an oak tree, and I'll hang you from the top of it. He was just as serious as he could be. The only time I ever outrun my daddy, he chased me with an ax to beat me with it for running my mouth to him. Uh, I don't think that's true. That's a true statement. He was mad. 
and I was excited to get out of his way. He'd have caught me. Now, he wouldn't have took the metal part, but he'd have took the handle of that thing, and he would have worked me over with it. He told me, he said, boy, I'll hang you from the top of that tree right there. You don't run your mouth to me. As long, yeah, I hear Sister Lois back there, that's right. You know why? Because she ran her mouth and got in trouble when she was young. She knows what I'm talking about. He said, as long as you're in my house, you'll go by my rules. I said, Daddy, I'm not in your house. He said, you're still going to abide by my rules. <laughs> so, it comes to a point. Mama back here has got one little feather. She's still cuddling him because she remembers she gave birth to that boy. Bill didn't go through no pain with him. Went through pain later. <laughs> He's gone through aggravation since then. He's gone through some things trying to make him be a man when mama still wanted him to be a baby. She took her and conceived inside of her and it became something alive inside of her and she brought that baby to the point of birth and she faced death to give life to that man. In her eyes, she will never see the man that stands before her. Because that's her baby. She put him on the breast or the bottle. I don't know what she done. That's between them. That's between them. But she nurtured him. She looked after him. He stomped his little toes. She petted him. She put mercurochrome on him. She iodined him. She put band-aids on it. When Brother Bill couldn't afford to even put food on the table, she would go buy the little SpongeBob Band-Aids or whatever was going on at that time, the real expensive stuff, and going down to the dollar store and paying a dollar for them, she'd buy that $10 stuff. Bill said, I ain't got that kind of money, woman. She said, that's my baby. And if he wants a Scooby-Doo Band-Aid, he'll get a Scooby-Doo Band-Aid. You just go to work. You better believe it. That's mama's baby. It's mama's baby. It's mama's baby. You better be thinking about the church this morning. You're mama's baby. But I'll tell you something. Mama's starting to pull them little feathers out from under your rear end, and it's going to get rough. Like I said, there come a day when Sister Sandra turned to get the biscuits out of the oven, and Brother Bill saw his time. He said, I put up with that woman long enough. And shy of killing this baby, I got to make him a man. So when she turned her back on her little baby, Bill reached over and grabbed that last feather. And when he grabbed that last feather, he kicked that nest, bam, as hard as he could. They asked John Wayne a question one time. Said, did you hit that man? He took and looked at the judge or whoever asked him that question. He said, just as hard as I could. Huh? That's what God does. When we turn our backs for the second, God will snatch that last little feather out. He'll kick you in the seat of the britches and you'll always have mama with you because it's going to leave the imprint. Huh? It leaves the imprint. And you can always look in a mirror and see your imprint of your mama. That's why we have imprints from Little Bethlehem, from Sardis, from King of Kings. We always carry around mama with us. We always carry around genetics of mama. We always carry around that nature. But there comes a time when the eagle must transform into the eagle, it must transform into the eagle and begin to fly. And today is that day. Who's getting baptized? Are they here? You look like a good one to get baptized. Today, you just like this young man standing up here. I'm going to dip him, I'm going to bury him. If I see bubbles coming up, I'm going to hold him down until he quits. 
I want all the sin nature gone. I want all the mom gone out of him. The only thing I want left in him is the imprint on his rear end where he was raised up into this church. From there on, the only thing that he's going to have is on the seat of his britches, the imprint. But the mind that he'll tote from here on won't be the sardis' is mine, but it'll be the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ and his understanding. You see what I'm saying? There must be a metamorphosis in our lives. At Sardis, this, I believe, is what's taking place. I do think that today is a symbol being the 13th. It's the understanding that our eaglets come to the point that it's now for them to become an eagle. I'm fixing to take care of this. I need somebody to move this pulpit for me. Slide it out of the way. Brother Don gets here. I think there's a speaker back there. He might need y'all to move that thing out of the way where he can walk back there. He is coming, isn't he?